What was the aha moment for you? You come back from the service that you decide that you can, you have some skill sets and just. I'm still wondering if I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, other people think you do, anyways. That, that's good. Well, your second year in high school, and I used to hitchhike out from Baldwin to Seaford, uh, Massapequa, and then walk up a couple miles and go to a place they called the Cedars, because the Cedars had long-eared owls. And I'd never seen a live owl. And I found out that you could walk in around there and you look for the droppings and you can see them. You have to be quiet and everything. And I, that was fascinating to me. And because uh, I ended up being a bird of prey freak. I wanted to become a scientist. I did a lot of experiments with snakes and snake venoms. Now I'm jumping all over time-wise here, but uh, I just assumed I was going to go to school and become a naturalist. And I started looking into the cost of going to college, and I knew my parents couldn't afford it, and I knew there's no way in hell I was going to pay for it. So I figured I've got to see if I can find some way to get into school free. And I got into high school free, I got a scholarship into that, so I looked around in the Pratt Institute and Cooper Union because, oh, I found out that the art was a lot easier to do than the engineering or the, uh, the Latin work you need with science. Get into Cooper Union, I didn't know if I'd make it as an artist, so I took the engineering test and I passed both of them. The architects had five years of school and a ton of homework. And the artists only had four years and they didn't have any homework. <laughs> or they, they did, it was voluntary. So then, it, that was an instant decision. How did the, the name Roger Tory Peterson enter your vocabulary? When I was in grammar school, one of my friends wanted to go down and, to, with the Baldwin Bird Club. What do they do? They go out watching birds. I knew all the birds. I knew the seagull, a crow, a blue jay, a sparrow, uh, and all hawks were chicken hawks. Why? Because people told me there were chicken hawks. So I knew all about birds. And I went down there and there were a bunch of these old ladies and the pretty nice gals. And this one, uh, Gertrude Selby, she and her husband had a home and I envied them so much because they had this little sparrowhawk house in the back and I could go up and I could peek in and see the sparrowhawk and in the back of their garage. And they had screech owls nesting in the apple tree next to them. <coughs> well, that, that was incredible to me. I mean, a hawk and an owl that I can actually see. But that first day, I'm going around, there's a chicken hook, there's a seagull, I'm making a real ass of myself. And then looking at these little books, little black and white book. And when we finished, Gertrude Selby gave me get her black and white book, A Field Guide to the Birds. And within two weeks, I knew the Latin name of every North American, uh, every bird in that field guide, every bird of prey in that field guide. There are birds, and then there are birds of prey. Uh, what, what do you think drove this sort of interest to that part of that genre? I think the fascination we all have with death, the fact that somebody can voluntarily choose to kill another one. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I may sound a lot more abstract than I really am. I, that would be my guess. So you can't wait right now for Netflix to come on with The Irishman. That's the well, I, that. <laughs> well, uh, well, every time we j jump around television, we yeah. da, 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 da. my wife says, we're going to watch it again. We've seen that goddamn Godfather a thousand <laughs> times. Concept. But uh, no, uh, I mean, I do not enjoy killing. I do not enjoy the sight of killing. But there's a fascination about it. It's like a magnet. She doesn't. 
I mean, she'd love to kill me, I suppose, but I mean, seriously, she, you know, she's very turned off by killing. But there's just something about it. I mean, <coughs> you find a lot of people that certainly aren't killers, and they don't like violence, and yet they're fascinated by that. The birds, and I knew them pretty damn quickly once I got that guide. I could tell by looking at one of those things, if it's a thrasher or a cat bird, they're both the same in the silhouette, or a thrusher or a robin, because they're both the same, by the genus. And he was a genius at that, absolute genius. For somebody like me, it was gold. My first direct communication with him was he was in charge of picking out wildlife stamps for the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, the, the, they're not the duck stamps, the wildlife stamps. And the first, Don Eckleberry, who had a lot to do with all of this mixture, Don used to have these parties, and I, have end, I, I ended up having them also, for bird artists or hunters or fishermen or something like that. Don was, was always a bird artist. And so he had, Roger was very, he, he liked the fact that I solved a lot of his, he, he had, he needed animals as well as birds, and I sent in a ton of stuff. And it, I guess it made it easier for him to, oh, give the kid a, you know, we need this, you know. I mean, that was, I, that's my interpretation of what he must have thought. Awe factor at that point? I mean, here's the guy that had written so much about it, and it was the field guide from you being an artist and he being a, an interpreter. It's my conviction that his field guide made it easier for housewives at first to look out the kitchen window while they're doing the dishes and look at the bird feeder in the winter time. Th to watch a bird feeder in the winter when you're enclosed in and see those little guys toughing it out in that cold, it, there's a magnet there. I am firmly convinced that the nature movement in this country was leapfrogged because of Rogers Field Guides. The novice division in the Winchester National Trap and Ski Championship. And I won a trip to London. Mm. And what I wanted to see in London, I could see at the airport. So I got myself a ticket from London to Nairobi. And that was my first trip to Africa. In 1972, you were <laughs> run down by an elephant in Zambia, which was captured on film and became a cause. There were three people involved, myself and this, I won't mention his name, he was an ex-big game hunter, and, but he was an American. He's telling me about how you can step into the charge of an elephant and if there's a psychological barrier there, like a log or some brush, he'll stop. He just wants to bluff you into backing off. Well, I saw, I went that morning, and I did it a couple of times, and I got videos of me running up and throwing sticks at the elephant. The goddamn elephant's only 40, 50 feet away. I had no idea what a stupid ass thing I was doing, but I was getting away with it. So now I knew everything about elephants. <laughs> so we have lunch with Eric Balson, who was the head of the game department, <clears throat> and this was a, they call it the International Wildlife Conservation Society, and what it was, was a wealthy man's low-impact hunting area, <coughs> which I enjoyed, but uh, the point is that's what it was. It wasn't something to help nature, <coughs> unless it was a byproduct. So we had lunch, and he says, I heard what you guys are doing over there. You leave my elephants alone. So no more of that. So we're over there, and he said, Guy, he says, we've got to get back to the ferry, otherwise we'll be in Tetsifly country all night and mosquitoes up the kazoo. I said, one more time. Well, this elephant, he didn't have big tusks, and he wasn't an incredibly big elephant, but at this point he was an angry elephant. And he's, I'll teach this little bastard something. And he came at me, and you know how the ears are out? They're flat against his head, and the tusk is rolled up so the tusks stick out. 
And I knew this is it. So I took my brand new balloon movie camera, threw right in his face and turned and I ran. Robin Harry won the Olympic, the German won the Olympic 100 meter dash that year. And I'll bet I was a lot faster than him in my mind, but not physically because he caught me. I turned, before he did, I turned around to see if he had stopped or to see where he had stopped. But I was running away from him and it, the, the predator ch prey. Now, you know, I wasn't, he didn't want to eat me, but I was the prey as far as he was concerned because I was ticking him off. <clears throat> and the trunk was about was reaching out for me a little, about that distance from my head. And I figured, oh Christ, this is it. So I ran and I felt this swat in the back of my back, knocked me down. And I remember vividly a touchy fly up here. I got more room up here than I do in this nostril. But he was up there buzzing around, had one in my, uh, or some kind of a fly in my throat, and sand all over the place. And he had a stabbing fetish. He could, just like that, he could have wiped me out. He's wedged me into the sandbank, came back down, hit me on the head with the tusks. But they were short, and he couldn't bend his neck that much, apparently. And he never thought to crush me with the trunk, which is what they normally do also. And a lot of this was on footage, so I talked about it. But it still sounds like a pile of, you know, nobody's there, so I can exaggerate it. And I was embarrassed about it, but people asked about it, and there was enough footage to justify it. But I always thought people thought that I was exaggerating or lying. Eric Borson wrote a book. And Buona, Buona, Buona Game, or something like that. But Eric Borson was the <coughs> professional hunter for the uh, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. He wrote a book, and it says The Koliak Incident. And it is word for word. In my book, the African Elephant, or the Lion book, or both of them, the incidents in there, his version isn't in. But when the publishers wanted to do the electronic version of the Lion book, which cost about three and a half bucks, we put Eric's version in. And you can see where I'm describing the up, up to it, and then he comes along, and this is what he saw. And it's word for word for what I had earlier. So ultimately, the elephant does back off. Oh, that's right. I forgot to finish it. <laughs> he hears, this, this is after lunch, and he's getting ready to take a nap. He's got a tough life. And he hears the elephant screaming. He comes out, and he sees the elephant. Now, he, he's on the upper bank of the Zambezi, uh, the Luangwa River. He sees the elephant coming. He sees me running in front of it, and he says, oh, my God. So he fires a shot in front of us, and usually that well, the sound alone will stop the elephant. Well, apparently the elephant here didn't hear it. I don't remember hearing it. I, I just that was about the time where I was looking at his trunk or something. And then he had me down, and then I heard a shot. He hit it in the honeycomb. The honeycomb is an area where a lot of elephant hunters get killed because they think it's the brain. And all it is is the fulcrum, bone fulcrum, to lift that very heavy trunk. So the elephant gets up, looks at him, and he's stunned, and he's spinning around. One foot's landing between my elbow and my belly. Another foot's uh, sliding into my back. Not one of them landed on me. Then he looks at him, and he comes back down on me and hits me again with a tusk. And that's the second shot that I heard, which was his third shot. The elephant gets up this time, really stumbling, and stumbles back to the herd and was feeding with the herd after a while, uh, we found out. Eric didn't have any more bullets. Mm. I mean, you t <clears throat> now, back then they called it the death euphoria. Now they call it the near-death experience. And I won't go into that because it's very personal, uh, very personal. And <coughs> I knew it was all over. And all of a sudden I get this peaceful bliss. I never felt so good in my life. I mean, 
it was it was incredible. I mean, if I could be if I could get that feeling by doing that, I'd do that right now if you had it. If I was convinced I could get that feeling, but I'm not, so I won't do it. But right at this time, I hear this voice: "We're not ready for him." Now, it wasn't in my ears, but it was very. We are. N we're not ready for him. And then I think there was a yet in there, but I'm not power sure. And there's a million other, th not a million, but a lot of other things that happen. And I don't know if I mentioned it, but I'm not the least bit afraid of dying. I don't want to rush it, and I don't want to get hurt, but I'm not afraid of it. It's going to be my greatest adventure because I think that's coming again. That really was cool. You talk about that with such emotion. Um, has that changed your life? I mean, did you get, was that a, a spiritual moment? Was a, I mean, I don't want to get into the personal aspect, but, but it, did it change you? Course, was that a course correction for you? No, it, it made me more crazy. You get to a point where you can make a living drawing. Uh, was that hard to get to that point? It's still hard. <laughs> yeah, of course it was. Uh, but I'm one of nine children. None of us were babied. We were all taught responsibility. And as Captain John Smith said at Jamestown, you don't work, you don't eat. Mm -hmm. And if I don't work, I'm not going to get paid to eat. My first job was $55 a week doing brassieres and can openers for the Sears and Robot catalog. A little studio on 34th Street. And uh, I worked there about, I guess, six months, and I told them I wanted a raise. Because I looked around, and I knew what I was doing, and I knew what everybody else was doing. He says, I don't give raises this soon, but he said, so-and-so said that you should get a raise too. I'll give you $10 more, $60 a week. I was insulted. I thought I... I have no idea how the real world runs. And uh, I started looking in the New York Times for artists, illustrators, and back then there were a lot of them. And I saw this ad for $150 a week as a food illustrator. That was more money than my poor father was making. And now there's a whole bunch of things happening in between here. But at any rate, I got the job, and I told the other guy that didn't care for his $60 a week. And uh, I did f mostly food stuff for American Can, Continental Can. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like the guy that I was working for. Uh, I just, I didn't respect him. He wasn't, in my opinion, a nice person. And it killed me that I had to work for somebody that I couldn't respect. That was power over me. I pay you, you do what I tell you. And I have a w wife and, and children to feed. That's a horrible, and everybody does it. But I was very fortunate. I, uh, well, I, I ended up quitting him and going with somebody else for not, not less money, but less time, so therefore less money. I learned how to hustle. I mean, I always knew how to hustle. I can't sell my own paintings, okay? But when I was in high school, it was a parochial high school, and we had these things, you go around, you donate a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars. And then back, back in the late 40s, It wasn't easy getting money out of people. And my parents, you know, a lot of these kids in school, the parents write out a check for $200, $300. I went around and I came in third out of all of the kids in the school uh, for, for all four grades. And the guys that beat me all had $1,000 donations. Every one of mine 
with ten dollar uh, singles, and I think I had a couple of fives and a couple of tens, and <clears throat> but I believed in it and I thought it was a good cause. When you go to Africa to do subject research or just to visualize it, are you a, a camera guy? Is that how you can, or do you see something and kind of grab it? It's a combination. I have, my camera fits in my side pocket. I don't have one of these. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I started off with a big 400 millimeter Novaflex one. The first couple of times I went over, <coughs> it was just too damn cumbersome. I'd go over with a cubic yard of film. And you don't know if you're going to get it until you get back home three weeks later. So you take two rolls of film of the same line giving you the finger or something. And uh, nowadays, I go over with a postage stamp and have 10 times as many photographs. And that night I can edit them mm -hmm. and take that lousy photograph and make it a fresh photo, uh, an, an unused photo. I, when I'm painting, I'll have a, if I'm doing a bald eagle, say, I have a two or three cardboards, one of the underside of a bald eagle's wing, assuming I'm painting the underside of a bald eagle. And I'll have some head shots and I'll have some tail shots and talons, excuse me, in the general shape that I want to draw it. And then like Roger, uh, I remember seeing a film on him where he would take, he would do the bird and then he'd do another bird and put it behind it and do it bigger and do it, put it in front of it. And I'd go through 50 pages of, uh, I'd go th through a whole bunch of pencil sketches, putting lines here, there, and everywhere. With Photoshop layers, I can take uh, two pencils, and in five minutes I can take what would take me a week. <coughs> that has helped. But when I see the photographs I take, and most of my photographs, and I'll take animals, but I'm more interested in backgrounds, mm -hmm. where to put a lion, where to put an eagle, where to put a anything. And when I look at that, I can, uh, what, it brings me right back to the feeling that I had then. So in the introduction of your book, uh, Animals Art, Roger Tory Peterson wrote, Guy is perhaps the most versatile and in a sense the most professional wildlife artist I have ever known because he can paint in any medium and in almost any style. Although Guy can paint with equal facility a kinglet, an elephant, or a striped bass, he excited about the predators, the birds of prey, and the big cats. So he hands you this and says, put this in your book and you read it for the first time. What's your reaction? Well, he, he said that in his introduction at Lee Yorkie at the Birds and Art, mm -hmm. and it's pretty heady stuff. When you realize I was starting out as a scared kid with mouths to feed and no money coming in, and this guy was so kind to me. He really was. Uh, I had heard <clears throat> a lot of story about a lot of the artists. But Roger, Don Eckleberry, Arthur Singer, and myself became very good friends. And when I, and I was much younger than all of them. And when he's up there saying this stuff about me, it's pretty neat. Surprise you as to where you are today? I mean, your name is synonymous with excellence. God, that sounds nice. But do you know, I really don't believe it. See, I look at every one of them. Now, I, they're framed beautifully, and they're, they're hung magnificently, they're lit beautifully. And I look at them, I see everything wrong. <laughs> everything that I, oh, I should have done that. Oh, I should have done that. But I've gotten to the point now where, oh, what the hell. It's, it's in a museum, and everybody's complimenting me, so it can't be that bad. Uh, and you're your own worst critic. Probably. I'd be glad to go around and just comment on the paintings so if you have questions about them very quickly. Uh, there's a painting in there of a snowy owl painted with a palette knife. 
If I have something important to say, I'll say, otherwise I'll answer your questions. Yeah. It's Puma Patrol 2. Oh God, this is the first one. It's going to be a long afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really, uh, tell me the time on this. It's a recent painting, uh, probably the last winter, <clears throat> and I just needed another puma for the for the show. And stuff like this are easy to do because it's so easy to get material on them. And this is, you know, this is not all that detail work. I I did two major paintings, this one and another one. I call this one the sneak. And all the herons are sneaky. The signature piece of the exhibit? Well, I think it's a big issue in the place you, and, you know, when you walk in it, it's more dramatic, I guess. It's such an imposing animal. It, and, you know, if you're going to do a wildlife show, it's a good one to do. Victoria Falls. Mm -hmm. And had you, did you actually go there on your trips to uh, Africa? I'm sorry? Were you at Victoria Falls in, in Africa? I've, I've probably been there a hundred times. Oh, I've been to Africa well over a hundred times. Been very fortunate. If I die and go to heaven, it's going to have Victoria Falls and Kilimanjaro in the background. <laughs> Definitely a decent job, they make it look good. How long would that take? So I'm looking at this painting of a tiger. Uh, from start to finish, is this three weeks, a month, six months? When the first stroke of paint goes on the canvas, the painting is 95% done. Hmm. And you want to know how long it takes to do the 5%. Yep. And it takes 80 years learning how to do the other part. <laughs> now, I'm not, this may be embarrassing, but if you look at that, do you see something that you could have improved on? Well, if I do, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'll block it in. <clears throat> but then I'll put the mountains in, and there's no detail in that, but it doesn't need it. The, the, the importance of that painting is the light. And then it, you just, once you have what you block in and you think is going to work, it's completely different when you fill in the background and the light changes. Does that convey cold? Yes. Uh, actually, it conveys buffalo in the air. <laughs> oh, I never thought of that. It starts off with, you know, the rough drawings as my imagination. but. <clears throat> Then when I have an idea of what I'd like to do, I'll, you know, I'll go through my files for all the buffalo. Uh, another thing, I'm, I may have seen something, I may have a photograph. <coughs> Jeez, I like that. And I don't like to copy the photograph, but I'll work from it and add stuff to it and change things. How are you? But this was something that just, I had the idea and but Roger came in, saw this, and then he's, he's, he sees this very tight, detailed stuff. And he, he just thought there's a whole bunch of new artists. Is there somebody in the field these days, if you put your, yourself in Roger's shoes, and you're the Roger Tori Peterson, and you're looking at that young artist, is there somebody that's brought your attention? Oh, there's a tons of them, but the problem today is <coughs> the cameras are so good. People are just copying their photograph. It's it's transparent watercolor, no white opaque. All of this stuff in here that, that looks white, it's just left out. It's nothing but white paper. Mm. <coughs> and I, a lot of artists will do watercolor and they'll put white on it. It makes it look better, but I, don't, I just the. Feeling I get if it works without using the opaque, I, I really enjoy. Uh, I guess you've had enough BS from me now. <laughs> this has been one special day for me. One of the things I used to love to do is go to my father's studio and he'd have all these pencil drawings up there. I used to love those more than 
Yeah. Oh, when I, when I did the painting of uh, oh, the book, the uh, big cats that Abram stood for mm -hmm. and made Book of the Month Club, I had the paintings, all the scans ready. Really. I had gone to the Museum of Natural History and got oh. Nancy Neff to do all the text, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Too technical for the average person. Mm -hmm. And they said, you got to do drawings for this. I can't do drawings, I don't want to do any more work. <laughs> and they taught me into doing the drawings, and it's the best start in the book. Because it, I don't put time in it because there's not much money in it. Yeah, but it's so much fun to do. Well, I used to like watching that as opposed to any of oh, those. so good at it. This time he was at the house, uh, <laughs> everybody had gone home, and we started talking, we're drinking wine, and we're drinking wine, and we're talking, and drinking wine. All of a sudden, the sun comes up. Mm, something so warm. I couldn't hear the damn I thing. <laughs> I lost my hearing in, in uh, Korea. And uh, he, 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 he was just, he had character. Don Eckelberry said, birds have character. He could nail it with those silhouettes. Mm -hmm. You know the genus. Yeah. You might not know it's a thrasher or a catbird, but you know it's a genus. Mm -hmm. Well, it brings good memories back.